My name is Elkin Allen. I was asked to go to Milwaukee to cover the trial of Jeffrey Dahmer, a serial killer of 17 people. Milwaukee is a very pleasant city in the state of Wisconsin, USA, just north of Chicago on Lake Michigan. Settled by Germans in 1835, it was famous mostly for its beer. That is, until 1991, when it found to its horror that it was the home of one of the most ruthless serial killers of all time, Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, who lived in this block on the seedier side of town. On the night of July the 22nd, a terrified young man stopped a police car to say he had escaped from a crazy killer who was going to cut his heart out and eat it. They went to the apartment where he said he had been held prisoner and they found a dead body and 11 skulls and other human remains. We're investigating a homicide which occurred in the apartment building in 900 block of North 25th Street. We do have uh, one person in custody and we do have a body in the residence. From our investigation, we feel that this individual strongly is involved in other homicides. Uh, we have taken evidence out of the building by the medical examiner to be examined. Uh, there were some hazardous material uh, in the building which private contractors had to remove uh, from the suspect's apartment. It was really different from, from the way garbage smelled. It smelled like, it smelled worse than rotted meat. Mr. Damler, you have a statutory right to have your preliminary examination within 10 days of today's date. Your lawyer informs me that you wish to waive or give up that 10-day limit and have the hearing scheduled on August 22nd. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Jeff Dahmer readily admitted to killing 17 young men, and he told the police where to look for their bones. When Roland Thomas began crying over his slain son, other family members leaned on one another for support. It's gonna be all right. The storm's gonna pass over. The storm clouds are not gonna hang here always. They're gonna pass over, not only for us, but for the entire city. When I was asked to cover the trial, I frankly was very reluctant to make this film record you're going to see. Dharma's confession, all 200 pages of it, was a catalogue of depravity about bizarre acts and parts of the body not usually mentioned. I objected, wouldn't we just be being voyeuristic and exploitative. But when I got there, I realized that this was not a trial in the conventional sense at all. The result was preordained. Whatever the verdict, Dharma would spend the rest of his life behind bars. No, for the people of Milwaukee, and perhaps for all of our civilization, this was an elaborate and necessary public expiation of his crimes in front of the relatives of his victims and the world's press and television cameras. By pleading guilty to the murders, Jeff Dahmer had left only one question open. Was he certifiably insane? A yes verdict from the jury could mean avoiding prison and living out his life in a secure hospital. A no verdict meant jail for life. To reassure America that Jeffrey Dahmer was only a sick human being and not a Halloween boogeyman, his gruesome life story was told and retold in court no fewer than nine times by lawyers, by police and by doctors. In this film, we have shared the narrative between a psychiatrist called by the prosecution, Dr. Park Dietz, a defense psychologist, Dr. Judith Becker, and the policeman in charge of the case, Detective Dennis Murphy, reading from Dahmer's confession. He remembered his uh, early family life as being one of extreme tension. States that tension came from the relationship that existed between his mother and his father. He stated that they were constantly at each other's throat and arguing. 
He stated his mother appeared to have some psychiatric problems and in fact had suffered a nervous breakdown at one time during his early childhood. He stated that she was on medication, had been seeing a doctor for much of the time. He states that he was advised by relatives that his mo mother had suffered a postpartum depression after he was born. And he took that to indicate that he was at least partially the problem for his parents' bad marital status. He stated he believed his mother became depressed after his birth and never quite fully recovered, and therefore he felt a certain amount of guilt in regards to the bad marriage of his parents. See, as a teenager of 15 or 16, he realized that he was a homosexual. He never had any interest in women, and he had no idea why he was a homosexual. But he distinctly remembers, that, remembers in high school and during his teenage years that he was only attracted to men. See, it was at this time he began to fantasize of killing human beings. He also began picking up animals which were found on the road which had been killed apparently by other vehicles. He would bring them home to his house and he would use a knife in order to cut them up, cut them open and see what was inside of them and what they looked like. See, at the time his mother took his younger brother, who was approximately six years younger than him, and she moved out and left him alone in the house. He said at this time he started having strong feelings about being left all alone and it was at this time he remembered having strong desires for not wanting to have people leave him. He stated that at this time he began hating to sleep alone at night. He further indicates that it was about this time in his life that he became, <coughs> excuse me, became familiar with alcohol and he immediately became a heavy drinker and abused alcohol on a regular basis. The timing of his first fantasies of bringing another person under his control in order to engage in sexual behaviors was sometime during the high school years. At various times, the specific age and grade that Mr. Dahmer has said this occurred has varied uh, within a year or two, but it seems to be around age 15 or 16 that he first had sexual thoughts of striking another person and rendering him unconscious by a blow to the back of the neck and then making sexual use of the unconscious body. The first time he tried or meant to act on that was when at around that age he found a particular male jogger attractive to him and he I believe broke off a baseball bat and then he uh, concealed himself in some brush near where the jogger was expected to pass with the idea that if the jogger came by he would strike him on the back of the neck make him unconscious and enjoy the man's body sexually for a time. The jogger didn't come by, and so that didn't come to pass, and Mr. Dahmer never saw the man again. But that seems to be the first effort to put this fantasy into action. In the summer of 1978, um, he then had a car and was living alone at the house. He had been drinking and was returning home when he saw a hitchhiker. The hitchhiker was not wearing a shirt, and he debated about whether or not to pick him up. He finally decided to pick this man up. Uh, the man's name was, um, and it's all right to mention yes, the names of the yes, victims. That's not. His name was Stephen Hicks, who was approximately 19 years of age. Stephen Hicks got into the car and agreed to go back to the house, uh, with, to Jeffrey's house. Jeffrey reported that they talked and smoked some marijuana. He reported that it was clear to him that Stephen Hicks was not gay, however he wanted to keep him there. While Stephen was sitting on the bed, Jeffrey hit him in the head with a barbell and then strangled him with that barbell. Jeffrey recalled having smoked one or two joints and had consumed a 12-pack of beer that day. The next morning, he went to the store and purchased a large hunting knife, and he went to the crawl space and dismembered the body. He cut off the arms and legs. He recalled opening up the belly. Now, at this juncture, 
This is the first time he opens up the belly of anything other than the dead animals, right? That's I mean, correct. At 3 a.m. as he drove to the dump, he was pulled over by police for driving left of the center line. Uh, he indicated that he passed the sobriety test. The policeman shined the flashlight in the back seat of the car and noticed the trash bags. Jeffrey told him that he was taking the trash to the landfill. He reported that there was a slight odor because he had had the body for one or two days. The policeman let him go. Jeffrey turned around and went home and put the bags in the crawl space. He brought the head upstairs, laid it on the floor, and masturbated in front of it. The next morning, he put the bags behind the house in the woods. He burned the clothes of the victim and then threw the knife and Stephen's necklace into the river. I asked Jeffrey how he felt about this, about those actions, and he reported that he was high-strung, nervous, apprehensive, and thought a lot about what he had done. I then asked him if he recalled the name of Stephen Hicks. He said that that was a name from the victim in Ohio. I asked him how he remembered that. He says, because you, it was his first one, and you always remember your first one. He says, you don't forget the first one. He then went, he subsequently went to Ohio State University for three months. He stated that he, quote, flunked out, end quote. He reported that during this time, he drank all of the time. By this time, his father had moved back into the house with his new wife, Sherry. His father and Sherry thought it would be a good idea for Jeffrey to join the Army. He stated he believed the reason he did not kill and dismember anymore while he was serving his tour of duty in Germany was because he enjoyed the structure of the Army. During the entire tour of duty, he lived on base and was in a dorm with three other men. He stated that he enjoyed the Army and wished that he would have finished his entire tour of duty. However, his abuse of alcohol made it impossible and the Army let him go six months before his tour of duty was up. He was employed at a chocolate factory where he mixed chocolate. While working at the chocolate factory, he made some friends but did not socialize with them after work. In essence, his life consisted of working and on weekends going to bookstores, gay bars, and bath clubs. He reported that at the baths, the notion was, quote, sex, anything goes, end quote. He reported that he used condoms some of the time. He stated that he liked being the active person in sex, that he only allowed anal penetration once or twice because it hurt him. He reported- We are not using the name of the drug. So I, I will not. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, he reported that he started using, and I'll just say a, a drug that had sedating effects. Sleeping okay? pills, I think. Right. He started using sleeping pills during this period because some guys wanted to perform anal sex and he did not want to. This was a way of keeping them. Specifically, he did not want to be the recipient of anal sex and consequently, if he were to drug the person, they would then fall asleep and he would not have to participate in anal sex where he was the receptive partner. That is where the person would put their penis in him. He reported that he would go to the baths on weekends and have approximately three or four partners. He was trying to control his compulsion. So he went to a store when it was about to close. He hid out in the store, and then he stole a mannequin from the store and brought it to his house. He kept this mannequin for two weeks. He would stand over the mannequin and masturbate. His grandmother saw the mannequin and asked him where he got it. He then took the mannequin out and disposed of it. At age 26, he reported that he was heavily into the bath clubs. He reported that at this time, he was working the night shift at the chocolate factory, would go to the bars on weekends, usually around 2 a.m. He reported that once he got to the bathhouse, he would find a person and then lay next to the person and masturbate and engage in what he called, quote, light sex, end quote. He reported that most of the men he met there did not want just the light sex, but wanted what he called, quote, heavy sex, end quote. He stated that once the person was asleep, he did not feel quite so rushed or pressured with the person. He reported that he would fix a drink in which he would put approximately five sleeping pills, 
and this would keep the person asleep for approximately eight hours. He stated he would stay with the person staying awake for about three quarters of the time and then he would sleep with the person. Usually he would masturbate three times during that period. He reported that he never injured anyone and never recalled attempting to strangle any of these men that he stayed with at the bathhouse. He stated that once he was in the room, he would have some conversation with the person, mix them a drink, and kiss them. The person would then get groggy, and the person would then fall asleep. He indicated that he would only experience an erection about 10% of the time when the person was in an awakened state. He reported that once the person fell asleep, he had complete control and could, do what at, to, and could do what he wanted at his leisure. He did not have to entertain the person, and he felt that he could leave the room if he wanted to. He indicated that he had drugged 10 or 15 people before the management learned what he was doing. Subsequently, his membership was revoked. He then started using a local hotel room. And he stated that at this point, the bathhouse had been a much more controlled environment. Now, he's telling you that when they're in a wakened state, he can only do something 10% of the time. He could only get an erection 10% of the time. Did you ask him about the other times when they were asleep? Yeah, when they were asleep, he was able to get erections. And I think it's somewhere here in my notes, it was either 90 or 100% of the time. This has got to be done. Who are these people that died? You didn't see their relatives come in and testify because there was a guilty plea. You didn't hear the facts in great detail. I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to forget who they are. Sometimes, and this is when I'm in my work, naturally I see people getting very concerned about a defendant, what's happened to a defendant. And because the victim is gone and dead, the victim isn't there to say, hey, what about me? What, what about me? Don't, don't forget... Stephen Tuomi, who died in the Ambassador Hotel with the defendant. He encountered Mr. Tuomi while he was waiting at a bus stop. He had already obtained his hotel room at the Ambassador, which he believes is located on 24th in Wisconsin. He had gotten the room earlier with the plan that if he had encountered someone, he would take them there for the purpose of having sex with them. He had already purchased some sleeping pills which he had at the room for the purpose of rendering anyone he brought back there helpless so he could have sex with them. He spoke with Tuomi and asked him if he wanted to spend the night with him at the hotel room. Tuomi agreed. Dahmer does not recall if he offered him money to come to the room or not. Upon arrival at the hotel, both Dahmer and Tuomi got undressed and laid on the bed. At that time, they, they had what Mr. Dahmer called light sex. He described this as hugging, kissing, and mutual masturbation. After about an hour or two, Mr. Dahmer made a drink for Mr. Tuomi, at which he put the sleeping pills. Mr. Tuomi drank this, fell asleep, and Mr. Dahmer kept drinking and eventually fell asleep himself. Mr. Dahmer related that when he woke up, he was lying on top of Mr. Tuomi, and Dahmer's forearms were visibly bruised. He saw that Mr. Tuomi was obviously dead. He was bleeding from the head, and his chest was crushed in, and some of the bones were broken. He reports blacking out and waking up in the morning. Stephen was in bed on his back. Jeffrey recalls being on top of him. He reported that Stephen's head was over the side of the bed, and there was a bruise on his chest. He stated that he, Jeffrey, had a bruise on his arm. Jeffrey was shocked when he saw that Stephen was dead. He stated that he had no intention of murdering him. Seeing Stephen dead brought back memories of 1978 and his first victim, Stephen Hicks. He stated that he had paced the floor, felt horrified, shocked, and frightened, and could not believe this had happened. He then put the body in a closet and went to a mall. He bought a suitcase and subsequently put the victim inside of the suitcase. He then rented the room for another night. At 1 a.m., he checked out and took a taxi to his grandmother's house. He kept the body in the fruit cellar for approximately nine days. One day, while his grandmother was at church, he laid the body out and, according to Mr. Dahmer, quote, slid open the belly and masturbated. The experience led him to make two changes. The first was, having realized how difficult it was to 
move a corpse from a hotel room, he decided not to return to hotels anymore. And from that point, began to take men back to his grandmother's house, where he would have greater privacy and more space to work. The other thing he told me was that uh, this changed his efforts to control himself. Uh, in his words, quote, after that incident, it seemed like there was no point in trying to resist the urges and the compulsion to do that. So that's when I started going out, looking around at the bars for other people. I asked, what do you mean there was no point? And he said, uh, just since it had happened again, much to my surprise, it just, I don't know, it's hard to describe, just seemed by that time the driving compulsion to be with someone and control them was so strong and so prevalent throughout all my waking hours that I just continued doing that. It seemed like that broke any thought of holding back and not doing that sort of thing again. Don't forget Richard James Doxtater on that board. James Doxtater, age 15, picked up by the defendant, age 15. He had been at a bar on a Saturday night. He was standing in front of a bus stop and saw an attractive male. He assumed that this male had been drinking and asked him if he wanted to spend the night for $50. The victim agreed and took a bus to his home when they said that's the grandmother's home. Um, they sat in the living room while his grandmother was asleep. They laid together, kissed, and engaged in oral sex. The male said that he had to be back by morning, and Jeffrey did not want him to leave, so he fixed him a drink. When the victim fell asleep, he strangled him. After he was dead, Jeffrey laid with him for a while and then had anal sex. He placed the body in the fruit cellar and put a blanket over him. The next morning, he ate breakfast with his grandmother, and she went off to church. He kept the third victim's body for one week. During this period of time, he would lay with him and masturbate. At the end of the week, he laid the body out and, according to Jeffrey, quote, defleshed it, end quote. Don't forget Richard Guerrero, who died at the defendant's hands. First, he administered a drugged drink to his victim, and then after his victim was unconscious from the effects of that, he strangled him, which again indicates that it was not an impulsive act, but rather that he'd taken steps to prepare for the killing and, as it were, to anesthetize his victim before he killed him. He then took the body to the basement, defleshed it, put it in a trash bag, and saved the skull. He kept the skull for several months and brought it to his 24th Street apartment when he moved there. He reported that the police never found the skull. He left his grandmother's home because he wanted to live on his own and because once his grandmother had commented on his bringing a young man to her home. This made him feel uncomfortable, and he made up a story about why the young man was there. The next intended victim got away and was able to testify against Jeffrey Dahmer. But he couldn't be seen on camera, as he was underage at the time. However, we and can hear his voice his and his name. My name is Ronald Douglas Flowers, Jr. Approximately what time did you get to the Club 219 that evening? Uh, not real sure. I think, I know it was late, uh, because the parking lot was pretty filled at the time, so I imagine it was 11, 11.30 around that time. Okay. And did you meet your friends there? Yes, I did. After the bar closed, what next occurred? They all left, and I went back to my car and tried to start it. And when you tried to start your car, what happened? Well, I had been having a problem with my choke, so I imagine that was what the problem was and it wouldn't start. And after I kept trying it and kept trying it, the batteries just died. <coughs> Pardon me. What did you do next? Uh, well, then I went to uh, a f the phone booth, which is located on the corner of 2nd Street in Pittsburgh, I believe it is. Did you come in contact with the person you now know as Jeff Dahmer? Yes, I did. He offered to give me a ride uh, uh, to go with him 
to get his car to bring it back to jump start uh, my car. He had the cab drop us off a, a, a little ways away from the house because he didn't want to wake her. He lived with his grandmother and he didn't want to wake her up. What happened when you arrived there? Um, I said, I'll just wait for you here. He was going in to get his keys, I believe. And I said, I'll just wait for you here. And he said, no, uh, why don't you just come on in? It'll just be a minute. And he offered me a drink. The next thing I recall happening was um, thinking to myself, why is he looking at me like that? Because for the first time, he, his eye contact was solid. Uh, it, he didn't divert it at all. And, I, and, and uh, it was almost as though he was waiting for something. I, I'm thinking to myself, what is he waiting for? So naturally, I started to drink the coffee quicker because I became uneasy to get out of there. <laughs> and the next thing I remember was becoming extremely dizzy and my head starting to go down, and that's it. When you say, and that's it, do you mean you passed out? Yes. What's your next memory? Woke up in the County General Hospital in Milwaukee. Were you missing any property? Yeah, I was missing, <clears throat> excuse me, I was missing all the cash uh, from my wallet. And I was missing a bracelet that was on my right arm and a herringbone chain that was around my neck. Uh. If you know, did the hospital remove your clothing at any time? Uh, no, they did not. They, I don't think they had a reason to. When you next undressed, did you notice anything wrong with your clothing? Yes. What was that? I, I noticed that my underwear were on inside out. He states that there was one more occurrence that happened, but this time the individual woke up prior to him being able to kill him, and he was also seen by his grandmother with this individual in the basement, and he decided not to kill him. As Mr. Dahmer described it to me, he drugged the man in the basement, and in the morning the man woke up after Mr. Dahmer had had light sex with him. Mr. Dahmer then took $80 from him, walked him to the bus stop, saw him get on the bus, uh, and said, quote, he was really out of it, drugged, and apparently woke up in some hospital, and that was it, end quote. I asked him if he thought he was going to get caught for that, and he said, no, because I hadn't hurt him in any way. And I said, well, you drugged him and took money, right? And he said, yeah, I figured they would just think that he just lost the money and that he'd been drinking. But Dharma did trip up after letting another underage victim escape. Did he say anything to you? Yes, he told me, like, um, he asked other kids if they would just pose for, you know, quick $50. If they would pose for a quick $50? Yes. And what did you say to him more, or what did he say to you then? I asked him if it is his career, or, or he said it's a hobby. He said it's a hobby? Yes. What, what did you say then, or what did he say then? He asked me if I, if I want to pose for him just for a quick $50. What, did, what then happened? Then we started walking to his apartment. After it had been pulled, your shirt had been pulled up to your neck area, was a, a photograph taken? Yes. He offered me some drink. Did he say anything to you about how, what you should do, if anything, with your zipper? Yeah, he, he said that I should put it all the way down and then, you know, show my underwear. And you put it halfway down, and then what did he do? He, he put it all the way down. And what else did he do? And then he, he grabbed my pe penis. He went under your underwear and grabbed your penis? Yes, he did. And then after he kissed your stomach, you said, I got to get out of here, something yes. like that. What did you do then? I just grabbed my book bag, and then I opened the door. and. You moved to the door of the apartment? Yes. Had the door, was the door of the apartment closed at that time? Yes, it was. And had it been closed after you entered the apartment? Yes. And what did Mr. Dahmer do when you went to the, to the door with your book bag? He said, wait, don't forget your money, and don't tell no one 
that I'm doing this. And what happened then? Did he give you the money? He gave me the $50. When is the next time you became conscious of where you were? Where were you? At the hospital. Are you employed as a city of Milwaukee police officer? Yes, I am. And what rank do you have? Currently a lieutenant of detectives. How long have you been employed by the Milwaukee Police Department? Since 1974. Did there come a time on September 27, 1988 that you were at work in the Milwaukee Police Department headquarters? Yes. Where is that building? 749 West 8th Street, City of Milwaukee. Did there come a time that you were aware that an investigation was underway in connection with a sexual assault on a 13-year-old Laotian young man? Yes, I did. He is a minor, and for reasons of protection of his name, he has been referred to in these proceedings as SS. Would you continue to refer to him? The jury is familiar with his full name. Yes. Uh, the inf what information did you receive, basically, that caused you to become involved in the investigation? At approximately 12.20 a.m. on September 27, 1988, officers Robert Enters and Gary Temp brought SS into the sexual assault unit of the Milwaukee Police Department. And had officers gone out to the home and then with him gone to the apartment building where this uh, took place and identified the particular apartment with his assistance. That is correct. And those uniformed officers from the manager had secured an individual's name and the location of his employment. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And you had information that that man was <coughs> Jeffrey Dahmer, that he was employed at a near west side uh, chocolate factory, uh, and that his, he was a third shift worker. Is that correct? That is correct. And with, armed with that information, did you leave uh, the vice squad offices and go to that uh, west side chocolate factory? Yes, but prior to leaving, I showed SS a number of photographs, including the person who had been identified by the apartment manager, and SS positively identified Jeffrey Dahmer as the person who had taken him to his apartment and taken these photos. This is what you refer to in police work as a photo array, is that correct? Yes. And you had Mr. P Dahmer's uh, picture on file from an earlier case where he had indecently exposed himself. That is correct. Did you then go to that uh, West Side Chocolate Factory with the officers? Yes, I did. Did there come a time that Mr. Dahmer was brought to you by employees at the factory? Yes. And what, if anything, transpired when you, did you recognize him from the pictures you had already shown the Laotian boy? Yes, I did. And what, if anything, any conversation occurred between you and Mr. Dahmer at that point? At that point, I asked him if he was Jeffrey Dahmer. He stated yes, and at that time I placed him under arrest. Did he ever confess to you that he had touched the boy's penis? No, he denied that. Thank you. We have to ask this question. Did he plead guilty to the charge? Yes, he did. Okay, so he may not have admitted it to you, but he pled guilty to the charge. That's correct. Thank you. Although he was put under probation for five years, Dharma was up to his lethal tricks again within three months. Don't forget Anthony Sears, who died at the defendant's hands. I probably swear all the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Please be seated, sir. And then would you state your name, spelling your last name, please? Jeffrey Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R. Mr. Connor, you were a friend of Anthony Sears, correct? Yes. How long had you known him before he was killed? Uh, approximately three years. You were friends? Yes. In fact, you were with Anthony Sears on the night he went home with Mr. Dahmer, weren't you? Yes. Let me draw your attention to Saturday night, March 25th, 1989. Did there come a time when you met with Mr. Sears that evening? Yes, I did. About when was that? It was probably around 10 or 10.30 at his apartment. Okay. Did you then go someplace together? Yes, we had gone out. Where'd you go out to? We went to Lacage. Lacage. What is Lacage? Lacage is a gay bar in Milwaukee. Where's it located? On Second National. And how did you get there? Uh, we took my car. On that evening, did you come in contact with a person now known to you as Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes, I did. I met him just prior to closing, which would be about 2 o'clock, 2.15. When the bar closed, what happened? Um, we had gone outside. Who's we? Uh, Tony, um, Jeffrey Dahmer, myself, and another friend of mine. Who's that friend? Uh, Bob Keel. Okay. 
And what did you do? Um, we had then gone to my car. Um, everybody had gotten in. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer and Tony were in the back seat. And then where did you go? Um, then we left that area to drop off Tony and Mr. Dahmer. Did somebody tell you that they were going home together? Um, I just kind of took that. Okay. Um, where were they going to go? Were they going to go to Tony's place or Mr. Dahmer's place? Mr. Dahmer's place. Okay. And did Mr. Dahmer tell you how to get there? Yes, he did. When you pulled over, did you have any discussion at that point? Uh, no. Okay. Did you talk to Mr. Sears at all, make plans with him about his being picked up? Yes, I did. What was that about? Um, I had just reminded him that um, that Sunday was Easter and that I had plans to be with my family and that in order for me to give him a ride home, I'd have to pick him up before I did that, which would be early morning sometime, and to call me. And did he agree to do that? Yes, he did. Did Anthony Sears ever call you that evening? No, he did not. Early the next morning? No. Did you ever see Anthony Sears again? No, I did not. He stated he met this individual that he identified as Anthony, Anthony Sears through the photo, and he got one of Mr. Sears' friends to drive him and Mr. Sears in the friend's auto to his grandmother's house. He related that when they got there, they engaged in sex. He gave him the drink that put him to sleep and subsequently killed him and dismembered the body. He indicated that this was the first one where he had kept anything of the individuals. He stated that he kept the victim's skull, which he boiled to remove all the skin, and he kept the scalp with the small ponytail because he liked it. He stated he kept the genitals of this person. He stated that at the time of his arrest, these items were in the black metal cabinet. Quote, I found him very exceptionally attractive, and the desire to retain something from him was stronger than the fear of being caught, I guess. That was about the time I had the table, the black table and the two griffins. And that's when I started formulating the idea of the temple area off of this. Mr. Dahmer drew for me a diagram of what he had in mind for the temple. And that diagram of the temple shows 10 skulls on a table with incense burning on both ends and two whole skeletons on either end of the black table with the plaster um, griffins above the uh, table and a special globe lamp to impart an eerie uh, sense of lighting. And he wanted a black leather chair so that he could sit in the leather chair and admire his collection. If he did this and had it set up this way, he would be able to become somehow get in touch with some spiritual force or power. It's the time I started watching Return of the Jedi. So the first idea of the temple area occurs only after three of the charged killings. And um, because this seemed curious, I explored what he had in mind about the temple and what the significance of this movie was to him in great depth and in fact he and I sat together and watched all of the scenes in the film Return of the Jedi that he considered significant. Likewise, there came a time later when he put that film aside and began making use of <coughs> Exorcist 3 and particular scenes from that in a similar manner and he and I sat together and watched those scenes from Exorcist 3 so that I could explore what the significance was to him of the images in those materials. And I think that what uh, emerges from all of that is an understanding that Mr. Dahmer regarded one character in each of those films, a character known as the Emperor in Return of the Jedi, and the character who's obviously supposed to be Satan in Exorcist Three a man who's confined in a cell-like area at that time. And what these characters have in common is that they are evil, 
and corrupt and powerful, and both have the ability to use special powers to control others. In the case of the emperor, he seems to be um, zapping people with energy beams of some kind and able to manipulate them in that way because it's futuristic. In the uh, Exorcist Three, the power comes from being able to create illusions to make people think that there are snakes crawling over them, to suspend people on the ceiling, to be able to um, do all manner of things. Each of the characters in the scenes that he repeatedly viewed actually torments someone else in a way that might be described as torture. But Mr. Dahmer said that was not what was appealing to him, though there were occasionally fantasies where that might be, that he never enacted that. And he's consistently told me that making others suffer was not his desire sexually, uh, but that he did identify with the power of these characters. The characters are, uh, are unattractive ones in both those scenes and not ones that one would expect most people to want to identify with, but he liked the idea of the power that they had. And it happens that both those characters are portrayed in the films with yellow eyes that give them an eerie look. And Mr. Dahmer even went to the extent of buying a pair of contact lenses with that yellow tint that he would wear uh, when he would go to the clubs so that he could have more of that look. His dabbling with these films and using them wasn't just ordinary curiosity. It's something a little more than that in that he uh, wanted to be more like those people. And he describes some sense of using the films to get himself in the proper mood to go out and cruise for a victim. And sometimes he would bring the victim home and watch a portion of a film with them and direct their attention to those scenes too. And so it did play some part in um, setting the right mood for him for committing these crimes. And he explained that he identified with the characters because he felt that he was thoroughly evil and corrupt, just as those two characters were. Don't forget Raymond Smith, who died at the defendant's hands. He stated that this individual was the first one that he took photos of. We showed him a photo album which contained 15 photos of a black male in various positions, and he identified this individual as a person he met at the 219 Club area and offered him the same line as to come to be photographed, to have a drink and look at dirty videos. The 15 photos that you're talking about, were they photos of a live or dead person? They were photos of a dead person. In various poses? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. He indicated that this victim agreed, and he took him to 924 North 25th Street, apartment 213, where he drugged him, subsequently killed him by strangulation, and after removing his clothes, he saw the tattoo of Cash D, the initial D, on his chest and pitchforks going up in the name of Cash. He ran into Cash D, who he thought was a black male prostitute, and offered him money to go home with him. While at his home, Cash D said he wanted more money. Jeffrey gave him a drink, laid with him, and then once he was asleep, strangled him. He recalled that prior to killing Cash D, he had brought another man back to the apartment and made him a drink, as he usually did in a coffee cup. The man drank the wrong cup, and consequently, Jeffrey drank the drink with the sleeping pills. He fell asleep, and the man robbed him of $300. Jeffrey did not report this incident to the police. He reported he would have strangled this victim, but the man had taken the cup without the sleeping pills. After Cash D, Jeffrey this next, met... This next one is a juvenile, so you can use initials. I will. After Cash D, Jeffrey met a man, uh, a young man with the initials LP, who was waiting tables. He was Hispanic, and Jeffrey believed him to be around 16 years old. He propositioned him, and the man agreed to go to his apartment. They kissed, masturbated, and watched videos. Jeffrey did not have any pills available to him that weekend. He went to an army surplus store and bought a mallet. 
He took pictures and had him lay on his stomach. He struck him on the back of the neck with the mallet. The guy got up and attempted to leave the apartment and said he would call the police. This male left and then came back in and asked Jeffrey for money for a cab. Jeffrey tried to strangle him at this point, but then calmed down, and they both went into the bedroom. Jeffrey called him a cab, and he went home. Jeffrey said that uh, this young male did call the police, but the police never followed up on the call. Don't forget Edward Smith, who died at the defendant's hands. He states that, states that he had oral sex with this individual and then killed him by the same procedure, drugging him until he slept, strangling him, and dismembering him. Jeffrey stated that he went to Sears and bought a five-square-foot floor freezer with locking top to store the defleshed bones. He also purchased two 30-gallon plastic trash bags to put the defleshed remains in. He poured muriatic acid to acidify the flesh and then flush the remains down the toilet. Yes, uh, after the complaint about the smell and somebody actually uh, identified his apartment as the source of the smell. So I had called and talked to him in the office and went with him to his apartment. And what excuse did he give at that time? He said his, his deep freezer broke, and he had meat in it that's getting spoiled. I thought he was a nice guy at the time. No further questions. Don't forget Ernest Miller, who was stabbed to death by the defendant because he was becoming conscious. The defendant had to get a drink to do it. Don't forget Ernest Smith. He had only a few pills available. While the victim was asleep, he thought, quote, how should I keep him, end quote. He did not want to put this person through any pain, and consequently he stabbed him in the jugular. He painted the skull with granite spray paint. He tried tasting the flesh and the heart. He bought a tenderizer, tenderized the heart, and ate it and the muscle meat. He reported that it had a beef-like flavor. It gave him a sexual thrill while eating it. He felt that the man was a part of him, and he had internalized him. Don't forget David Thomas, strangled by the defendant. Mr. Dahmer told the police that once he had David Thomas back to his apartment, he thought that David Thomas wasn't really his type, and he killed him because he had already given him the sleeping potion and thought that Thomas would wake up and be angry. Don't forget Curtis Strauder, strangled to death by the defendant. Quote, he was gay and he wanted anal sex, so I made the drink mixture. He fell asleep, used the handcuffs. This was the first time I used handcuffs. Took a pic, uh, strangled him, took pictures. Don't forget Earl Lindsay first drilled and eventually killed by the defendant. This is the first of the instances in which he drilled a hole into his victim's skull. And here Mr. Dahmer reported that he first drugged Mr. Lindsay and uh, thereafter used what he described as the drilling technique on the top of his skull. And we discussed this in some detail in the course of that discussion, he said that after initially having drilled the hole and injected a, I, I would call it a syringe, it's a baster actually, um, a syringe full of muriatic acid into the uh, cranial cavity of Mr. Lindsay, that Mr. Lindsay woke up. And when he uh, regained consciousness, Mr. Dahmer said he was groggy when he woke up, but still coherent and aware of his surroundings. And so I figured it was a failure. Gave him more sleeping pills, he fell asleep, then I strangled him. Because what Mr. Dahmer wanted here was the compliant sex partner, the zombie as he described it, rather than to have 
a corpse. It was his intention to keep this man alive if that was going to work, but when he concluded that he had failed to achieve the compliant partner with no will, only then did he strangle him. So what's another way to look at it is that uh, when he couldn't have the zombie-like creation he was hoping for, he was willing to settle for a corpse. I asked him um, in that discussion the question, you didn't expect him to wake up and say, yes, master. And he said, no, no, but that was the general idea. Later in that same conversation, he said, quote, I was just trying to disable the will. And I asked, and subject them to your will? And he said, right. Don't forget Tony Anthony Hughes, first drilled, then extinguished by the defendant. Mr. Dahmer didn't try to kill Tony Hughes, uh, but rather Mr. Hughes died through the foreseeable but unintended consequence of this drilling technique. He um, drilled a hole into his skull and poured in acid, uh, and Mr. Hughes died then, even though it was Mr. Dahmer's intention to keep him alive in this altered state. Um, and so uh, there's no compulsion here to kill. He'd rather he not have died. Um, and it was not any impulsive act of killing, but rather a planful act of trying to provide himself with a compliant sexual partner. Don't forget Conorak Synthesim phone. Age, as I recollect, age 14 for a couple of days of sexual pleasure. He stated that he met him while he was walking around the Grand Avenue Mall. He indicated that after introducing himself to the victim, he offered him $50 to accompany him back to his apartment to pose, have some drinks, and watch videos. He feels it was about 5 p.m. when they got there, and once inside the apartment, the victim disrobed down to his black bikini panties, and he posed for several photographs during the time he walked him into the bedroom area and sat him on the bed, Mr. Dahmer states that the victim, Tony Hughes, whom he had killed several days earlier, was lying naked on the bedroom floor. He stated that the Asian boy, he believes he saw him, but he did not react to it. He feels this was because of the rum and coffee and sleeping pill mixture. After he realized he was unable to arouse the victim, by mouth to penis sex and by body rubbing and kissing him, he continued to watch the video and drink beer until he himself fell asleep. After a few hours, he woke up. It was quite late out, approximately 11 or 12 p.m., at 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., or maybe a little later. He realized the victim was still sleeping because of the effects of the drink he gave him, so he decided to go to the tavern located on 27th, just north of Kilburn, the Care Bear Bar. He continued drinking there. And at closing time, <clears throat> excuse me, after leaving the tavern, he began walking eastbound on West State Street. He observed the victim, the Asian boy, sitting completely naked on the southeast corner of 25th and State. The victim was sitting on the curb. He stated there were two black females standing by him, and they appeared to be hysterical. He walked up to the victim, whom he realized was speaking to the black females in Asian. The victim was disoriented and appeared to be intoxicated by alcohol. However, Mr. Dahmer realized that he must still be under the influence of the drink containing the sleeping pills that he had given him. This time he advised the ladies that the victim was in fact a friend of his and he attempted to pull the victim in the direction of the apartment. He stated that the women continued screaming at him, we don't know who you're really we don't know if you really know this guy, and we called the police. Why don't you wait until the police get here? In the early morning hours of May 27, 1991, you were a city of Milwaukee police officer. Is that correct? That's correct. You pulled into that alley with your squad lights on? The headlights of the squad car were on, yes. And you got out of the car? 
That's correct. What did you do after you got out of the car? What did you see and what did you do? I exited the car. I was the passenger of the car. There was a group of people in the alley and they were all pointing to a white male and a second Asian male who was naked uh, just east of our location in the alley. Uh, my partner came up to me and told me that he had obtained information from the white male to whom he was talking to and basically that the Asian male's name was John Hamong and that he was uh, 20 years old and that he had been staying with him for the last, I believe he said, two to three weeks. Had been staying with whom? With Mr. Dahmer. He also had obtained Dahmer's name at that point. Officer Perupkin and myself and the Asian male and Jeffrey Dahmer began walking toward the rear of the apartment. Uh, while we walked back to the apartment, Mr. Dahmer spoke of the crime in the neighborhood and how bad he thought it was. He said he was glad that the police were in the neighborhood and uh, that there was a need for the police. Um, I believe he may have been smoking a cigarette during that time. As we got near to the apartment building, it was the rear of the apartment building, obviously, um, he spoke of the need for extra locks on his apartment and that he had a security system because of the, the crime and the nature of the neighborhood. He showed you up to his apartment? Correct. And he convinced you that you could go about your business, that he had everything under control? We were convinced that all was well. And there wasn't anything that you saw that could, for one moment, have caused you to believe that there was any problem at all, correct? There was nothing. Mr. Dahmer told me that after the police left, he gave a second injection of muriatic acid and that that proved fatal. But even then, he was attempting to carry out the plan to create a zombie. His words were, then I gave him the second injection of muriatic acid and that was fatal. I didn't intend it to be, but it was. Don't forget Matt Turner extinguished by the defendant. Jeffrey had attended the Chicago Gay Pride Parade and met this victim at a bus station. He offered him money, took him home to watch Exorcist 3, had light sex, drugged him, and strangled him. He deflashed and acidified the body, saved the skeleton in the freezer, and put the head in the freezer. He threw the other body parts into the trash, Jeffrey noted that around this time, the body meat in his freezer was getting old, and he disposed of it. Don't forget Jeremiah Weinberger, drilled, who made it alive, struggled for life for a day and a half before he died at the hands of the defendant. One or two weeks later, he met his 15th victim, Jeremiah Weinberger, age 25, who was of Jewish Puerto Rican descent. He met him at a bar in Chicago. He approached his victim, offered him money. The victim performed oral sex on Jeffrey. They took the bus back to his home. They kissed, engaged in masturbation, watched a video, and Jeffrey then gave him a drink. Once he was unconscious, he drilled a hole in his head and used boiling water. He reported that this victim woke up and was functioning but was groggy. Jeffrey then gave him more pills and another injection. He reported that the victim went into a coma, and the next morning he was still in a coma, and Jeffrey tried to wake him up. Jeffrey went to work, and when he returned home, he found that the victim was dead. He stated that he felt bad because he wanted the victim to be coherent and to carry on a conversation with him. Jeffrey stated that he engaged in the drilling technique to avoid having to strangle and kill his victims. I asked Jeffrey how things were going at work at this period of time, and he told me that he had been missing days at work because of his victims. He said he was at a point where he could have been fired. Well, he, he, he kept promising to get rid of the smell, but I told him that that was the last time I can tolerate it. Okay. And so I had to contact my office to put that in writing to him. So. 
In any event, at that point in time, did you have a mindset that he was going to be evicted no matter what because of the odor? That's what I had in mind. Don't forget Oliver Lacey dying at the hands of the defendant. He reported that Oliver was black and was a bodybuilder. He offered him money. They had light sex. They watched a video, and Jeffrey drugged him. He reported that he then called into work sick, and he was then fired. He had kept the headless body of his 15th victim in his bathtub. According to Jeffrey, Oliver never saw that body. Jeffrey reported that he did not use drilling on this victim. He drugged him, strangled him, performed anal sex before and after death, posed him, and took pictures. He also defleshed his 15th victim at this time and saved the head. He was going to use Vic Oliver Lacey in his temple area. At this point, he had lost his job, was drinking heavily, and running out of money. Don't forget Joseph Bredehoft dying at the hands of the defendant. Mr. Dahmer stated he met him on Wisconsin Avenue New Marquette University, and this individual was waiting for a bus, and he had a six-pack in his arms. He stated he got off the bus, approached him with the same offer as he did with the others, and he agreed to go with him to his apartment. They went to his residence, where he had oral sex on this individual before killing him. Since he gave him the potion, and when the individual went to sleep, he strangled him with the strap. He subsequently put his head in the freezer and his body in the 57-gallon barrel in his residence. Joe Braderhoff was the last person Jeffrey Dahmer was to kill. The man he had picked for his 18th victim was in court to tell how he escaped. You saw me swear out testimony you're about to give this matter. It'll be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me that. Please be seated. Then, sir, would you tell us your name and Tracy. spell your last name for us? Tracy Edwards, E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Mr. Edwards, we're going to ask you to speak up very loudly into the microphone. Uh, I would like to know in what state do you reside at the present time? Louisiana. And how old are you, sir? 32. 32? 32. And you are single? Yes. And you were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on July the 22nd, 1991? Yes. And at or about that time, on that late afternoon, did you have occasion to see a person that you knew at that time or subsequently learned was a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes. So you were with a couple of your buddies, were you? That's correct. And what were you doing? I uh, was drinking beer, just talking, hanging out, you know. About 6 o'clock at night was this? Yeah, about 6, 6.15, whatever. Did you have occasion then to see Mr. Dahmer? Yeah, he approached us eventually and started talking to us. Yeah. Were you three black males? Yeah, uh, one, one white, two black males. So you're a friend? Yeah, my best friend was white. Yeah. When he came up and started talking to you, what is it that Mr. Dahmer said to you? Uh, he said he was just in the city from Chicago. He was taking care of her sick grandmother, I believe, in West Dallas. Yeah. Did he have any further conversation with you and your friends? Yeah, he was just talking. He said he was a professional photographer. He usually pays people for pictures and stuff like that if he, anybody was interested in making money at that time. To, to have to pose for pictures. Yeah. Did he describe right. the kind of pictures that you were going to be posing for if you chose to take him up on the offer? Uh, he said nude. Nude. Right. You went up to the apartment. Tell us what happens when you get up to the apartment. Tell us what you observed, what your senses told you. Okay. First of all, it seemed like a normal apartment. When we got inside, he turned off burger alarms. I asked him why. First, it was a foul odor, okay? Tell and us about that. What kind of an odor? It was, was just it? like an odor. I didn't quite know what it was. You know, he told me a sewer pipe had broke and management would take care of it. Now, you're fully clothed. Yes. Okay. And you're sitting on a couch. Right. And he offers, he talks to you about uh, these, this posing and you weren't sure you are going to do it. Right. How much had you been offered to do the posing? A hundred dollars. Okay. And when he get, brings you the beer, he brings you rum and coke? Yeah, he bring that. Yeah, he brings the beer first, and then he brings the rum and coke. Okay, when you start talking about the fish in the fish tank, do you bring that up or does he? Uh, he does. And what do you do when he does that? I turn my turn to the right, like the fish tank is here. I'm turning all the way over here. 
You yeah. turn to your right to look at it? To look at the fish tank, right. And when that happens, what happens to you? All, all of a sudden, a handcuff and a knife is pulled on me. Yeah. Handcuff is placed on your body? Where? Uh, on my left wrist. And you see a knife? Yeah, the knife, yeah. Now, at that moment, what do you do? First, I feel fear. Then I ask him, what's going on? You know, this is not necessary, you know, to pull a knife on me. At that Are you moment. afraid? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any reason to know why he did that? None whatsoever. Did you have any idea at that time it was going to happen? No. Did that room have a TV set in it? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. There was an Exorcist movie on yeah. You know which one of them? Uh, the name, I'm not sure. I think it's three. I'm not sure which one. So there was a movie. Did you know it to be part of television or VCR? Uh, VCR. Normally, that's not on regular television, so I thought it was VCR. You knew there was a movie show. Right. Did you see him put it on, or was it on? No. When we first got into the apartment, he went through the back, to the back bedroom. Maybe he put it on then. I'm not sure. Okay. And then what happened? You're both sitting on the bed? Yes. Are you still in handcuffs? Yes. Is he holding the handcuff? Right. You still have the knife? Right. Is it pointed at your side, as you've told us before? Right. You trying to be cool? Very much so. You're not, a, you're not fighting with him? No. What's your all. intention? What are you planning on doing? Getting away. I was contemplating on at a point, jumping out the window. I was basically talking with this person, trying to let him know I was his friend. Yeah. As you were sitting there on the bed, when he had you by the handcuff and a knife at your side, at that time, which would have been maybe 7 o'clock? Something like that. What impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation that you observed of Mr. Dahmer? His frame of mind is what you want to know, right? Okay, he acted... At times, he would go through, like, different changes with me, you know? One Tell minute, us about that. One minute, he's, like, nice. Then he was telling he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him, things of this nature, you know? Yeah. Well, what did you think about him as a person? What impression was made on your mind of this fellow that you're dealing with here? Yeah. That at times, he wasn't himself, and then at times, he was, was like a nice guy, you know? He would come and go different times, you know, throughout the whole time. Then he would, like, sit being quiet at times, watching the movie, wanting me to watch the movie, you know, and just doing little tanning sounds, you know. Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? Right, he would like to start rocking back and forth when he, you know, certain parts of the movie or whatever. You have to sit, what did he say, madam? He was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth, right? Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? Uh, I'm not even sure, sir, but it was just like, I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It was like a slow slur, like mm, some of that nature, some close like that, I'm not sure. Did it keep on for a period of time? Off and on throughout the ordeal. And how about the, the movement back and forth? How, how was that being effectuated? Uh, just like back and forth, he would do it every now and then. You know? Just as you are rocking in right, your chair. Like this. And chanting. And chanting. Was there any parts of the movie that was going on that you saw that he said anything about? It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that had got possessed and that, uh, and that uh, it would seem like he was like interested in that part. That part had his attention more than anything. Yeah. But tell us about what you mean by that. What impressions were made upon your mind when this was going on, he has to had his attention. How, would he, how did he appear to you? It appeared like, like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part, you know, being demonized or whatever in that nature. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah, Ant like he wanted that, that type of movie, that part, certain parts of that part interested him, you know. It was like he changed with it at times. Then he would get more aggressive, try to get me to handcuff myself both hands. He's told me it made him feel more dominant. Okay, did you and he move off of the bed at any time? He told me to lay down, face down, put both of my hands behind my back because he got, 
he changed again at that point, like he got more aggressive at that time. Okay, now, but tell us, tell us, uh, did he still have the knife out? Yes, he still had the knife out. And what did you do? Okay, I kind of like laid on my sides for some reason. I guess God told me not to lay flat down or let this person handcuff me, so I didn't. So you were trying to stop that from happening, but you right. got down on the floor. Right. What did he do? He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point. What was he doing with his head? Pardon me? What did it appear to you he was doing with his head? What was he trying to do? Like he was listening to my heart, because at the point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. He said he was going to eat your heart? Yes, that's correct. So I suggested we sit on the couch. I had unbuttoned my shirt to try to make him feel more at ease. And then, and then I just sat on the couch like, and he just started going out of himself again. Going out of himself? Yeah, he was like paying me no attention at that time. Like yeah. he wasn't there? He was, yeah, he started the chanting again, and it's like just sitting there, you know. And then I just, for some reason, I said, well, I need to go to the bathroom again, and he didn't follow me at that point. So I reached up, I got up, and then I got hit him, and I ran out. You hit him? Right. Did you have any other belongings there? Yeah, I have my bag right there at the end of the couch. I sit in exactly the same place as I sit when I went in there. So when you got up, he let go of your cuff to let you go to the bathroom again? Uh, he didn't even, he just like, just let me stay there. I was going to go for the window. At that point, he didn't even have the cuff. It's like I wasn't even there anymore. And when you saw that, what'd you do? Mm -hmm. I just seized the opportunity. I said, well, at least I'm going to die trying. I'm not just going to sit here, you know. What'd you do, son? Uh, I hit him, and I ran towards the door, and he, like, was right there, tried to grab me, get me back in there. And what happened? Then I made it outside. So he wasn't able to bring you back bring in? Bring me back in there, no. He tried? He tried. And as you left that apartment, as you got away from him, I'm going to ask you again, what impressions were made on your mind by the conduct of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the actions of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the manner, expressions, and conversations of Jeffrey Dahmer that you observed? Can you give us some words? It's like I told the policeman that this freak, this crazy guy, was trying to hurt me. Yeah. Did you run out of the building? Yes, I did. Did you summon help? Yes. Milwaukee Police Department? That's correct. Did they come back there with you to the apartment? Right. Did you eventually go back into the apartment with the Milwaukee police officers? Yes. And then he was arrested. Right. Dr. Dietz explained the compulsions of Jeffrey Dahmer. The favorite activities he describes are what he often refers to as light sex, kissing, touching, rubbing, hugging, the kinds of activities that between consenting adults would often amount to foreplay are things that he has emphasized uh, with victims and with other partners those were activities, and, and those are normal activities with a consenting adult, that give him pleasure and that he always enjoyed. But he describes difficulty in getting partners to restrict themselves to just that, because the partners that he found most often wanted to do more than that. And one of the things more than that that some of them wanted to do was to have anal sex with him which he did not like, having had a few painful experiences. He did not want to be in that position. Also, the partners that he was able to find universally had a deadline when they had to leave. And he was unable to spend as much time as he wanted doing these more gentle, ordinary activities with them. And so he devoted a considerable amount of his energy to finding a way to be able to have someone, or if not someone, something, that could serve that role for him as being the person or body or part with whom he could have such gentle activities as rubbing and touching and hugging and masturbation and kissing and fondling. And 
it's in the course of trying to find a way to keep a person for that that he engages in most of the more extreme behaviors surrounding the killings for which he's charged. If I understood what Mr. Dahmer told me correctly, and we spent a lot of time on this during, during my examination, his preference, his first choice, would have been always to be able to have a living, breathing, consenting partner who permitted him to engage in all of these light sex, to use his term, activities that were his favorite. And in fact, he said to me that had any of the victims agreed to stay with him for several weeks, then he would not have killed them if they'd agreed to stay and, and do these things. And in, there were a few whom he found particularly appealing because the physique was so close to his ideal that uh, had he been able to have a continuing relationship with those men, he felt he would have had no need for any of the rest of what he did, no particular desire to do it. So if he couldn't have them in that way as a consenting, continuing partner, the second best way would be to have them in some other state in which they would remain with him and still be available for these activities. And the second choice that would be best for him, he thought, would have been if he could have had one of them whose will had been destroyed. And the two techniques he actually tried were, uh, of course, drilling into the uh, skull and injecting acid into the, uh, what he thought would be the frontal lobe region, and likewise drilling into the skull and injecting boiling water into the frontal lobe region. And Mr. Dahmer is not the first serial killer to wish to create sex slaves and to take steps to try to create such persons who would be available for his sexual use. His third choice, and one that he often uh, got, really, was an unconscious partner. Because someone who is unconscious but alive allows him to do all of those things that he likes to do. His next choice after that was that if he could find one man with sufficiently attractive physique to keep permanently while dead, that would be useful because he could do many of the things he wanted, though not quite all. And here what he considered was something he heard about on a TV show. Uh, when we discussed it, we both thought we might have seen it on 60 Minutes. But uh, neither he nor I am sure of the particular show. But w one show did something on people who freeze dried their pets. And Mr. Dahmer's idea was that if he could get the apparatus for that and freeze dry a man of the appropriate physique, he'd at least be able to continue to have him to look at while masturbating, to pose perhaps in various positions if they were flexible enough in that state, to fondle, to rub, to hug, to touch. They would not have sounds to listen to, but they would have a lot of what he was interested in. And he thought that if he'd been able to freeze dry one of the more attractive men, that he would not have had a desire for the other victims. The step he took was to go to the library and in a magazine he thought was called Taxidermy, found an advertisement from a supplier of the equipment for freeze drying animals and found that there were two sizes of the machines, one of which seemed like it might be large enough for humans, but the cost was prohibitive. It cost $30,000 or so, he thought, and so that was not an available option. The next best choice was that of a fresh corpse. 
Now, the fresh corpse, like the freeze-dried person, has the problem of not having any sounds to listen to, but it has the additional problem that it will not stay fresh. Lastly, uh, along this spectrum of people or bodies or parts under his control was the other uses he made of those whom he in fact had killed. And here he told me that he made use of the viscera for masturbation by opening the victims in the course of dismembering them. And there was a particular phase of, the, of dismemberment where he would stop sometimes to take photographs, sometimes to masturbate, sometimes both. And that was upon opening the abdomen when the abdominal viscera are first exposed. And he would masturbate while looking at that. And that was a long-standing image as far as I could determine. That was an interest he had had since late, uh, late in high school. And this gave him occasion to make use of that particular image. And that's basically the spectrum of controlling another person. Now, to call all of that just necrophilia really sort of misses the mark, but it's, it's the best word we have at the moment for it. And if Jeff Dahmer seemed normal enough on the surface, the court-appointed psychiatrist, Dr. George Palermo, explained why. All of us, all of us, so-called normal, let's say, have features of dependency. We have uh, uh, sadistic features at times when we are not too nice to, towards people that we do, uh, let's, we are with, we like, uh, and so on. We have also fetishistic features because when uh, someone of our dear ones dies, what do we do? Certainly we don't have a, a sexual fetishism, but uh, we, we, we try to embrace even the dead body because of the importance we give to this dead body, this person who was dear to us and, and, and died. Uh, and that goes along with, uh, with the uh, borderline personality. Borderline personality uh, changes mood uh, uh, from depression to elation. We all have these kind of things. Not to that degree, though. We, all, we are a composite of many facets, and uh, we become sick when uh, these facets become exaggerated. And that is what is called personality disorder. The jury had to decide whether he was sane or insane. So it was to be prison after all, not the softer option of a secure hospital. The jury's decision was read out 15 times, once for each count. Again, in the state of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey Dahmer, case number F912542. Uh, in a special verdict, question number one. At the time the crime was committed in count two of the information, in regard to the death of Richard Guerrero, did the defendant Jeffrey L. Dahmer have a mental disease? Answer, no. The spectators now included high school parties, organized to remind youngsters of the perils of going with strangers for fun or for money. And that this was no ordinary trial was emphasized by allowing the relatives of the victims to address the court and, at last, to confront Jeffrey Dahmer. My name is Shirley Hughes, and I'm Tony Anthony Hughes' mother. First of all, thank God. and to give thanks to the judge and to Mr. McCann for the verdict that came in. I would like to say to Jeffrey Dahmer that he don't know the pain, the hurt, the loss, and the mental state that he had put our family in. But I'd just like to read a poem that a good friend of my son wrote. Tony thought you was his friend. He knew you. Why am I a victim in your cruel and ruthless world? Although I can't communicate with a loud voice. Listen to me anyway. Try to have mercy on my moans. Look at the tears roll down my face. See that each one is a cry for help. And realize, realize my sign of showing you that I want to live. Tell me just what is it that I've done to you. 
to make you such a monster, to make you such a maniac, to make you such a devil. My God, who are you? What are you? You have never shown me this side of you. I put my trust in you. I thought you were my friend until the end, yet I didn't know you as well as I thought. I never felt the end would be this way. Is there anyone that can help me, mom, dad, sister, brother, someone, please help me? What ha what's happening to me? Everything seemed to be slowing down. I'm confused. I'm drowsy. My coordination has been contaminated. My friend, what is it that you have given me? What is it that you're doing to me? I'm helpless. Is that a thrill to you to know that I can't fight you back and that the hardest struggle in my life is fighting to keep my eyes open with the hope of seeing the dawn of a new day? Yet you have total control over me. My life is in the hands of once a friend, but now a total stranger who have, who have become my worst nightmare. But one day I know you'll get caught. You think you're smooth at what you're doing. Remember, whatever's done in the dark, it will come to the light, and the whole world will know just how ugly a person you really are. Mom, I'm gone. My hope, my breath, my want to live have been taken away from me unwillingly and emotionally. I know that you're, there's a dragon piercing your heart day and night because of this, but yet I'm not far away. When you get cold, I wrap my arms around you to warm you. If you get sad, I'll softly grab your heart and cheer you up. Two fingers and one thumb means I love you in sign language. My son was deaf. When you cry, take one teardrop and place it outside your window ledge. And when I pass by, I'll exchange it for one of mine. Two fingers and one thumb, Mom. My name is Dorothy Strader. I'm Curtis Strader's mother. Um, I don't have nothing prepared to say. It's just a few things that I would like to say. You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I love him the last time I saw him, which will be a year tomorrow. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. She'll never have a chance to sing and dance with him again. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I'm a J.W. Smith. Uh brother of Edward Warren Smith. Edward Warren Smith tried to be Jeffrey Dahmer's friend. As a result, he lost his life. Mr. Dahmer, Eddie's gone now, the victim of your senseless killing. Where do we go from here? We ask ourselves. Why did this happen to a person like Eddie? He gave so much and asked so little. All he wanted was a chance to be himself, a chance to be happy. When all the facts are known, we hope that society will have gained some knowledge that will help prevent a tragedy such as the one Eddie suffered. There was no sacrifice too large or too small for Eddie. He truly loved giving and gave of himself abundantly. My name is Inez Thomas, and I'm the mother of David Thomas. You know, I don't understand how a person could really harm a person and to say that, well, I did this because he wasn't my type. Well, if everybody go around doing something to somebody because it's, they're, they're tight, this would be a sad world today. And I just feel that this man should never be able to walk the face of earth or to be able to harm anyone else again. Good morning, Honor. My name is Donald Bradoff. I'm the, for the Bradoff family. As much as love in our family closed, my mother gave five beautiful kids. We lost, he destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. I love this world. You guys did a wonderful job. Bottom of my heart, thank to God, I'm, I got a lot of strength. Thank you all. God bless America. Excuse me. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again.
Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker. The court will impose a mandatory life sentence plus an additional 10 years on the habitual criminality. Count two, life imprisonment plus 10 years consecutive to count one. Count three, life imprisonment with the date of parole eligibility 70 years from the inception of that particular sentence. I don't have all the numbers that I can't work it out, but it'll be 70 years from the beginning of that sentence, which will be consecutive uh, to count two, count four, life imprisonment with a parole eligibility to be 70 years from the commencement. Count 15, uh, life imprisonment with parole eligibility to be 70 years after the inception of that sentence to be consecutive to count 14. I, I have, believe I have and I intended to follow the recommendation of the state. I, I could have said something different which would have had the same impact. I really see nobody gains anything by just to say more and more years. The important point is that the sentence is structured in such a way that this defendant will never again see freedom. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle and I decided that maybe there was a way for us to tell the world that if there are people out there with these disorders, maybe they can get some help before they end up being hurt or hurting someone. I think the trial did that. <laughs>